live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering Red Hat Summit 2019. Brought to you by Red Hat. And welcome back to our coverage here on theCUBE, Red Hat Summit 2019. We're at the BCEC in Beantown, Boston, Massachusetts, playing host this week. There's some 9,000 strong attendees, uh, packed keynotes, just a great three days of programming here and educational sessions. <laughs> Stu Miniman, I'm John Walls. We're joined by Mike Peach, who is the VP and General Manager of Middleware at Red Hat. Mike, good to see you today. Great to be back. And Mark Little, VP of Engineering at Middleware at Red Hat. Mark, good to see you as well, good sir. To you too. Yeah, first off, let's just talk about your ideas at the show here. Um, you've been here for a few days. Uh, as we've seen uh, on the keynote stage, wide variety of uh, first off announcements and great case studies, uh, great educational sessions, but your impressions of what's gone on and some of the announcements we've heard about this week. Well, sure, I mean, <clears throat> definitely some very big announcements with, with RHEL 8 and OpenShift 4. Uh, so as middleware, we've been a little bit, uh, a little bit more in sort of a guerrilla mode here, while the uh, while some of the, the bigger announcements take a lot of the limelight. But nevertheless, um, those those announcements and the advances that they represent are very important for us in middleware, particularly OpenShift 4, um, as the sort of the, the the next layer up from middle uh, from OpenShift, which the developers uh, sort of touch and feel and live and breathe on a daily basis, we uh, are the immediate beneficiaries of, of much of the uh, advances in, in OpenShift. And so that's uh, something that, you know, we as the, yeah. the middleware guys sort of make real for the enterprise application developer. And I'd say, probably for me, building on that in a way, one of the biggest announcements, one of the biggest surprises has got to be you know, the first keynote where we had Satya from Microsoft right. on stage with Jim. Uh, you know, announcing the collaboration that we're doing. Um, I, I never believed that would ever happen, and that's that's fantastic. Has a benefit for middleware as well, but just for Red Hat as a whole, who would have thought it? Who would have thought, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, we, we actually, we just had Marco Bill Peter on, and he was talking about, he's like, look, we've actually had some of our support people up in Redmond now for a couple of years. Um, we had Chris Wright on earlier, and he says, you know, sometimes we go to these shows and you get the big bang announcement. It's like, well, really, we're working incrementally along the way, and open source, you can watch it. It's, uh, you know, sure, sometimes you get the new chipset, or there's a new this or that, but, you know, it's very, very small things. So, in the spirit of that, maybe you know, give us the update since the last time we got together. You know what's happened in the middleware space, as you said. You know, as we build up the stack, you know, we got Rel 8, we got OpenShift 4, and uh, you know, you're sitting on top. Yeah. Well, one one aspect that's uh, an event like this makes clear in almost a, a reverse sort of way. We we put a lot of effort, particularly on Mark's team in getting to a much uh, more frequent um, and more incremental uh, release cycle and style, right? So getting away from sort of big bang releases every year, couple of years, to a much more agile, you know, incremental, uh, again, you know, sort of regime of, of, of rolling out functionality. Now, one of the downsides of that is that you don't have these Big grand product announcements to, uh, to 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 make a big deal about in the same way as uh, Rel just did with eight, for example. Uh, so we we need to rethink how we sort of uh, <laughs> absence the the sort of the big dot O releases. Um, you know how we sort of batch up the interesting news uh, to and, and roll it out at at a large event like this. Now one of the things that we have been working on <clears throat> is our uh, our. our application environment narrative, right? And then the whole idea of the story here is that, um, you know, many people talk about cloud native and about having, uh, you know, lots of different capabilities and services in a cloud environment. Um, and, and as we've sort of gone through the, particularly the last year or so, it's really become apparent from what our customers tell us and from what we really see as the opportunities um, in the cloud native world, the value that we bring is engineering all these pieces together, right? So that it's not simply a list of these disparate, disconnected, independent services, but rather middleware in the world of cloud native reimagined. It is capabilities that when engineered together in the right way, they make for this comprehensive, unified, cohesive environment within which our customers can develop applications and run those applications. And for the developer, you get developer productivity, 
And then at runtime, you're getting operational reliability. So there really is a, a sort of a dual-sided uh, uh, value proposition there. And this notion of middleware engineered together for the cloud is, is what the application environment idea is all about. Yeah, I'd add <clears throat> kind of one of the things that ties into that, which has been big for us, at least at, at Summit, uh, this year is uh, an effort that we kicked off, uh, or we announced two months ago, called Quarkus. Um, and um, as you'll know, you know, a lot of what we do within middleware, within Red Hat, is based on Java, and Java is still the dominant language in the enterprise. But um, it's been around for you know, 20 years. It developed in a pre-cloud era, it had, and that made lots of assumptions on the way in which the Java language and the JVM on which it runs were developed, which aren't necessarily uh, that conducive for running in a, in a cloud environment, a hybrid cloud environment, and certainly a public cloud environment based on Linux containers and, uh, and Kubernetes. So uh, we've been working for a number of years in the upstream open, open JDK uh, community to try and make Java much more uh, cloud native itself. Uh, and Quarkus kind of builds on that. Uh, it essentially is a, what we call a, a kube native uh, approach where we optimize all of the middleware stack up front uh, to work really, really well in, in Kubernetes and, and specifically on, on OpenShift. And it's all Java though, that's the important thing. And now if you know, people look into this, they'll find that we're showing performance figures and memory utilization that is on a par with some of the more, um, some of the newer languages like Go for instance, very, very fast. Typically your boot time has gone from you know, seconds to tens of milliseconds and mm. people that have seen it demonstrated have literally been blown away because it allows them to leverage the skills that they've, they've had invested in their employees to learn Java and move to the cloud without telling them you guys are going to have to learn a completely new language and start from scratch. All right, so Mark, if I get it right, because you know, we, we've been at the Kubernetes show for a bunch of years, but this is, you're looking at kind of the application side uh, of what's happening in those you know, Kubernetes yeah. environments. Uh, so many times we've been talking about the platforms and the infrastructure down, but it's the, you know, the app piece on top, super important. I know down the dev zone, people were you know, buzzing around all the, all the Quarkus stuff. What, what else for people that are you know, looking at the kind of cloud native containerization space? What, what are the areas should they be looking at when it comes to your space? Well, again, tying into the app environment thing, um, hopefully you know, you've heard of Knative and, and Istio. So uh, Knative is a, to put it in a, a quick sentence, is essentially a, uh, an enabler for, uh, for serverless, if you like. Uh, it's a way of spinning up containers really, really quickly based on events. Uh, but really any serverless platform lives and dies based on the services in which your business logic can then rely upon. You know, do I have a messaging service there? Do I have a transaction service or a database service? So we've been working with, you know, with Google on Knative and with Microsoft on Knative. Uh, to ensure that we have a really good story in OpenShift, but tying it into our middleware suite as well. So many of our middleware products are now Knative enabled, if you like. The second thing is, as I mentioned, Istio, which is this sidecar approach. We'll go into details on that. But again, Istio, the aim behind that is to remove from the application developer some of the non-functional business logic that they had to put in there, like how do I use a messaging service, how do I secure this endpoint and push it down into the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So the security service, the messaging service, the caching service, et cetera, they move out of the business logic and they move into Istio. But from our point of view, it's our security service that we've been working on for years, it's our transaction service that we've been working on for years. So these are bulletproof implementations that we have just made more cloud native by embedding them in a way in Istio and like I said, enabling them with Knative. You know, we, we had, I think we mentioned, Stu did, Chris Wright was on earlier, and uh, one of the things he talked about was you know, this new data-centric uh, focus and how you know, that's at the core of so much of what, what, you know, what enterprise is doing these days. Um, the fact that with networks being as distributed as they are, and you've got so many data Inputs coming in from mm. so you know and to uh, to a unified uh, 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 user trying to get their data uh, the way they want to see it. You might want it for a totally another uh, other reason, right? How, I'm just curious. How does that influence, or how has that influenced your work in terms of making sure that that transport goes smoothly? Because you do have so much more to work with. 
in a much more complex environment for multiple uses that are unique. Yeah. Right? It's not all the same. Huge, huge impact for sure. The whole idea of decomposing an application into a much larger number of much smaller pieces than was done in the past has many benefits, um, probably one of the most significant being the ability to make small changes, small incremental changes, and afford a much more uh, trial and error approach to innovation versus you know, more macro level planning, you know, waterfall as they call it. Um, but one of, the, you know, one of the implications of that is now you have a large number of entities, whether they be big or small, there's a large number of them running within the estate. And there's the, the orchestration of them and the, the, the interconnection of them uh, for sure, but you know it's a you know it's a it's a it's a you know n squared relationship, right? The more the more these entities you have, the more potential mm -hmm. you know connections between each of them uh, you have to um, somehow structure and manage and ensure are are being done securely and and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, so that is that has really driven uh, the need for new ways of. Of, of tying things together, new ways of in, essentially integration, right? It is, it is definitely uh, uh, amplified the, the need for disciplined API management, for example. Mm -hmm. it, is, uh, it has driven a lot of uh, increased demand for an event-driven approach mm -hmm. where you're streaming in real time and distributing events to many receivers and uh, uh, dealing with things asynchronously and not depending on round trip times uh, for everything to be consistent and, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's, there's just a, a myriad of, of, of implications there that at a you know, very detailed technical level you know, drive some of the things that we're doing now. Yeah, I'd just add that uh, in terms of data itself, you know, we've probably heard this a number of times, data is king. Everything we do is based on data in one way or another. Um, so we've, as Red Hat, as a whole, in Middleware specifically, we've had a very strong data strategy for a, for a long time. You can't, you can't look at, just you've got myriads of myriad types of data, you can't assume that one way of storing that data is going to be right for every type of, of data that you've got. So you know, we've worked through the integration efforts on ensuring that you know, no SQL data stores, relational data stores, in-memory data caching, uh, and even the messaging service as a whole is a way of storing data in transit that allows you to, in some ways, allows you to actually uh, look at it in an event-driven way and make intelligent decisions. So that's a, that's a key part of, uh, of what anybody should do if they are in the enterprise space, but mm -hmm. certainly what we're doing because at the end of the day, people are building these apps to use that data. Well, gentlemen, uh, I know you have another engagement. We're going to cut you loose, but I do want to say you're the first guest to get uh, applause <laughs> from across the way. I don't know if people at home can hear, but, uh, but so congratulations. Uh, uh, you're ver being very well received already. Uh, I, I, I think they're clearly tuned in to the renaissance <laughs> yeah, of Java yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, Thank you both. Thanks for the time. Thanks, thanks so we much. Appreciate that. Back with more. We are watching uh, Red Hat Summit 2019 coverage. We're live on theCUBE.